are the pilot of a spaceship in the middle of an epic galactic chase with a fleet of enemy starships close on your tail. Now, ahead of you, there's a dangerous field of asteroids and floating debris. But behind you, the enemy is closing in. Now, luckily for you in this moment of doom and despair, you have two other space cadets sitting in the cockpit with you. The first one, who's a little paranoid, warns that if you fly into the asteroid field, you face almost certain death since the probability of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Now, the other one, who's kind of a wise guy, says, never tell me the odds, and urges you to fly full speed, full speed, full speed ahead. So, what do you do? Do you believe the prediction and take your chances with the bad guys, or are you willing to bet on 0.0002% probability of surviving an asteroid field? Do you believe a number more than you believe a narrative? If you're a big enough nerd like me, you probably recognize where this example is from. It's a decisive moment in the movie Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. The gang is sitting in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon, and C-3PO urges them to consider the odds, while Han Solo decides to completely ignore them. And then somehow they run this asteroid field completely unscathed, and everything ends up being fine and good. But does it bother anyone else that that just happens? How the hell did they escape with such ridiculously low odds of survival? How did a bold whim conquer such a morbid statistic. It turns out that this Han Solo C-3PO dynamic isn't uncommon at all. In fact, movies and TV shows love that kind of juxtaposition. The pessimistic statistician, always on the side of logical, detached judgment, with the bold risk taker, who believes in something more than just the calculated odds. One of my favorite examples is the medical drama House MD, starring the pill-popping, misanthropic Dr. Gregory House, who makes astoundingly clever diagnoses for his patients based on one guiding principle. Everybody lies. Contrast that with this team of diagnosticians who often buy into their patient stories at the expense of statistical medical evidence. But in House, unlike in Star Wars, it's the pessimistic statistician, not the humanistic team, that usually makes the life-saving call. And the list sort of goes on. There's the brilliant deductive Sherlock Holmes versus his more literal fellow detectives in solving criminal cases. There's the statistician in Moneyball who leads the Oakland A's to glory using hard stats instead of the baseball, baseball insider's usual strategy. There's something interesting about the different ways that people think analytically or anecdotally, and what they choose to believe, numbers or narratives. And we don't even have to look past our Netflix catalog for proof of that. Behind this filmic world of numerical savants and charming storytellers, there's a rich, interesting history of real-life human beings reconciling these two frameworks of numbers and narratives. Think about this. If you look at the earliest Mesopotamian tax and crop records, if you look at the first ever government revenue accounts in ancient Greece, if you look at the first ever census of England in the medieval ages, what do they all have in common? It turns out that they're all databases. Other than the simple difference of computers that do most of the writing for us today, these are really the same as this. From the very beginning, human beings have been using spreadsheets to crunch numbers for simplifying the complex, trading goods with nations, organizing militaries, following the stars, tracking the rays of daylight, constructing the great monuments. But interestingly, there are some so fundamentally human aspects of our society that even numbers can't capture them. Things like our legends, our law, our literature, for every crop collection database, there's a story of community turmoil during a seasonal famine. For every census of a population, there's a story of a single person. 
from the very beginning, narratives, when used correctly, have helped us in preserving the complex. Fast forward to the here and now. In 2015, I founded the Tufts Independent Data Journal, where we use both of these age-old tools, numbers and narratives, to study what the world, particularly the Tufts world, looks like today. We've analyzed our own government's financial records. We've issued censuses of our own population. And finally, we've looked at stories of ourselves, some serious, some not, including this one. Whether in ancient empires or college campuses, we need both the numbers that simplify the complex, giving us the bird's eye summary, and the narratives that preserve the complex, giving us the rich microscopic details. So it seems that when numbers and narratives agree with each other and don't contradict each other, that we can just use both. If both House and his team agree on a diagnosis, then both the stats and the stories check out. But what happens when numbers and narratives tell us opposing things? What do we believe then? Well, let's think about what happens when we believe the wrong thing. Consider some of the boldest storytellers of 2016 so far. Some who are so good at telling stories that we often forget that they're not entirely truthful stories when we look at the percentage of their statements over the last few years that are mostly false. On the topic of politicians during election cycles, we could recall our good friend Dr. Gregory House's catch line, everybody lies. Despite running extremely targeted data-driven campaigns, politicians ironically falsify their data a lot. Because story-driven rhetoric is a powerful vehicle for persuasion. It appears rich and detailed, and it's easy to listen to and understand and believe, even when it's verifiably wrong. And this is what happens when we, as an electorate, choose to listen to only the stories and none of the statistics. The most convincing storytellers can become some of the most powerful people in the world whether or not they're right. And do we really feel good about that? Now let's see what happens when we go wrong the other way. What happens when our policy decisions are guided only by the numbers and none of the stories? There's a policy proposal from the AEI Brookings Joint Center for Regulatory Studies that gives us a picture. Now, according to this proposal, the societal loss in productivity from not being able to use a phone while driving is approximately $24 billion in the US. This proposal also estimates that the cost from uh, phone-related car casualties on the road, the cost from using a phone while driving, is about $1 billion in the US. So if you do the math, according to the numbers, according to the $23 billion of gain, we should support texting and driving, right? Policies like this based on just the numbers make sense until we ask ourselves, where would we place the value of a human life on a spreadsheet? Is it enough to measure a life with a number? And see, this is what happens when our policy decisions are guided only by the numbers and none of the people that they could affect. The most convincing statisticians can become some of the most powerful people in the world, whether or not they're right. And do we really feel good about that? It's just extreme and unrealistic to have this binary of numbers-driven policy on one hand and rhetoric-driven pol politics on the other hand. But see, in real life, the best politics and policies are guided by experts who are both social, and data scientists. And these are the experts who are neither Han Solo or C-3PO. These are the hybrids. These are the people who are bringing policy closer to the stories and politics closer to the data. And this is not just true for the political domain. 
See, in real life, the best lawyers, the best doctors, the best sports coaches, and yes, even the best criminal detectives will not be savants with either numbers or narratives, but will instead belong to this hybrid strain of statistician-storyteller. So in the end, what is the right way to bring numbers and narratives together in a way that they don't disagree with each other? To this, I propose a simple solution. Less intellectual monogamy. See, if we want to breed this future strain of statistician storytellers, we need more qualitative scientists to go on dates with the data, and we need more quantitative scientists to go on dates with the humanities. We need, in short, people to be less intellectually monogamous if we want the next great wave of human advances to be ushered in. Just like how all of these people did in the past. But see, the next Hildegard, the new Da Vinci, the next Akbar, the 21st century polymath, is going to be the computational historian who builds the first ever big data platform of ancient Mesopotamia's tax and crop records, the information designer who paints a data visualization helping policymakers in India measure rural poverty, the quantitative psychologist who builds a mathematical model explaining human selfishness, the statistician storyteller bridging both quantitative and qualitative methods to tackle society's biggest problems. Personally for me, as somebody who went from pastel paintings and high school portfolio art to data visualizations at the Tufts Computer Science Department, somebody who went from hating math to majoring in it, somebody who went from writing scripts of poetry to coding scripts in Python, for me, I've always kind of been in the middle, the bat in between the beasts and the birds, the STEM students and the humanities majors. See, in the liberal arts animal kingdom, we are initially told to pick our species, and then we divide ourselves into quantitative and qualitative majors. And we guide ourselves by this educational taxonomy instead of the numbers and narratives that we are hungry to discover. But at the end of my time here at Tufts, one thing I've realized is that there's really no such thing as a major or a field or a subject. In the end, beneath feather and fur, statistic and story, we are all just seeking out evidence for the same truths, just in slightly different ways. And as statistician political scientist Edward Tufte said about truth, evidence is evidence. Whether words, numbers, images, still or moving, the information doesn't care what it is. On the topic of truth, I'd like to consider a broader note of self-examination by asking, what are your numbers and narratives? Was it your essays? or your SAT scores that got you into college? Was it your GPA or your cover letter that landed you your first job? Now, was it the number of your friends attending TEDx or what they had to say about it that even made you come here in the first place? Right here at Tufts University, Dean of Undergraduate Ad Admissions, Lee Coffin, has stated the importance of both voice and data in the game of college admissions. But really, all of us play these numbers and narratives games every single day, shaping our behavior, our decisions, our communities, and ultimately our lives. And it makes you think that at the end of the day, you are a statistic. And so is everyone else. But you are also a story. And so is everyone else. The question now is, what will your relationship with intellectual monogamy be? Thank you.